little rascal. That's not for you. <laughs> I've been spending the first couple of hours every morning working out here in the garden. And the reason is actually twofold. First of all, it's just so much more pleasant working this time of the day and it's been exceptionally warm and exceptionally dry. And also the TT races are on, which are high speed motorcycle races that happen here on our actual roads. So the roads get closed off. The island's population literally doubles during this time. And later on, the scream of motorbikes just takes over. And in fact, in the morning, you will definitely hear some motorbikes in the distance because people get up early to do their own lap of the course before the roads get shut and the actual racers start. So we have been hiding out here at home and I've been getting a lot done outside. And aside from all of the work and the jobs this time of the year, there's also harvesting. And I'm here in front of two rows of strawberries that I planted not too long ago. I got them as bare root plants over the winter, potted them up and then planted them out. And they are producing tons of berries. Behind me, these strawberries are ones that I dug up and brought home from the allotment. And they also have lots of berries and flowers on them, but they're a little bit further behind. And these will probably come into fruition in the next couple of weeks or so. But for now, I need to get picking these because the blackbirds have been very interested in these berries. And I can see one lying a little bit further down the path here that must have been picked off and chucked down there earlier on. So I wanna get these picked, also do some trimming of the runners and then get these netted as well. It's the garden in June and I have a lot to show you. We're going to have our usual tour around the vegetable garden and the polycrub. We'll have a little look to see how the Oya watering cups are doing and all of the different crops growing in there. We're going to be planting up some containers with edible crops. There's a plant search trial that I've been conducting this spring and I want to share some of the results with you. And there are more crops to harvest as well including broad beans and some radishes. Let's go pick some of those. I have two veggie pods on the deck now, this much larger one, which is brand new, and the medium sized one back behind me, which I've had for a couple of years. And I have an assortment of lettuces and salad greens in here, also carrots because it's a good deep planter and this is elevated so it keeps the carrots safe from carrot root fly. I've sown all of this area over here with carrots, they've had some really good germination and I would like to sow some more today and in fact what I'm going to do is harvest all of the radishes that I have growing over here and then sow this area with some fresh carrot seed. And I'm gonna show you how I do it. And the way that I do it, I think is really a great tip for success when it comes to sowing carrot seeds, because I know a lot of people do struggle with getting them to germinate, putting them out in the garden and then seeing nothing happen. So we'll get to that in just a second. But first I want to take these radishes out because I have something planned for them. I'd like to make fermented radishes again with a chive blossom or maybe a couple put in there as well. And we had them last year and they were absolutely delicious and also a bright pink color. Back to the veggie pod. I'd like to sow some fresh carrot seeds today. And although I have plenty of carrots on the go in the same planter, those will produce crops for early summer. The seeds that I'm gonna to sow today will create carrots that I can harvest later on in the summer. What I'll do is I'll just smooth over the compost. I won't add anything new. And then I'm going to create a few drills. Once I have those drills ready, I'll pre-water them, sprinkle carrot seeds inside, and then top it up with just a quarter of an inch of fine compost. Tap it down a little bit, then I'll give it another watering in, and then let it grow. I have 
quite a few container plants on the walk up to the polycrub but these ones here I'm going to be planting dahlias in and you can see them waiting to be planted and inside the greenhouse we have quite a few plants as well not as many as earlier on in spring and some of these we need to plant today including these gorgeous mints that I picked up at the Malvern Spring Show. This one is black currant mint and it really does smell of black currants. And then the other one is a lime mint. And yes, it does have that lime scent and this is going to be perfect for mojitos. Now that we are in late spring and the sun is getting stronger, Anything inside the greenhouse is going to get the full force of the sun coming through the panes and also holding the heat in here. And so what I've done is I've painted this strip of glass panes with shading paints. It's a type of paint that we can use on our greenhouses and it softens the lights. And I really wanted to protect these plants growing here and they're all pretty much ready to be planted out. But I wanted to tell you about these plants before they go out in the garden because these are part of a trial that I started earlier on this year. I've introduced you to a little device called Plant Surge, and it is a clip-on magnet that I have on my hose. And a couple of years ago, I was gifted from the company one of their earlier models, and then since then I have their newer model is one that doesn't rust. So they were gifted, so that's full disclosure. But I've never done a trial, I just thought, why not? If it works, it works. It sounds great because the idea is that it magnetizes the water. So it's energized and that could lead to an increase in the number of flowers, the size of plants, the yields on your crops, all of that. And I've been using it for years and I mainly just kind of forget about it. It's over there on the, on the hose. I have it attached just below the tap. It, it waters, plants grow, whatever. So this year, I finally decided to do a trial just to see how do plants grown with plant surge do against plants that are not. And so what I did was I created two groups of plants and they have the exact type of planting scenarios, so same potting mix, same pot sizes, same module sizes, same exact seeds, all of that. And they even have different drip trays so that there's no cross contamination with the water. And I've got my tap water one over here and plant surge over here. And right from the go, I was pretty astonished because I had expected maybe to see an increase in the number or the size of plants. But what I, I saw at first was that the plant surge seeds germinated actually a lot quicker. It was crazy to see. So they germinated quicker. And in a lot of cases, the plants got quite larger than ordinary tap water. And the reason I use tap water is because the plant surge is connected to the hose, which is connected to the tap water. And so the only difference between these plants is that this one has the plant surge magnetized water on it. And so after seeing the increase in size between plants and the germination rates, I'm 100% sold on plant surge and I will continue to do trials over the years just to see for myself as well how how they actually compare. And I think next year what I'll do is I'll start off my tomato seedlings with it. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Plant Surge, there's more information in the video description. It's been two years since I replanted the David Austin roses here on the new arbor. So I brought these from the old house and I am so happy as well that I brought them along and look at all of the flowers on them. I needed to do a little bit of deadheading, but soon they will absolutely cover this arbor. How stunning will that look? Let's go have a look at the veg patch. There's a lot happening in here as usual, and I've done a lot of clearing out and replanting, and we're gonna do some planting of leeks in just a little bit. Now, the peas that we planted in the last video, they have grown up 
the pea sticks you can see here good size and I've even spotted a few flowers so we'll be getting peas very soon this bed that I have netted here in front these had the spring cabbages and they still do because those large cabbages that I'm letting heart up so develop those heads of cabbage those are the spring cabbage and you can see that they are starting to form heads but in the gaps where I've taken plants out I've put in some new plants so those are uh, a red cabbage these young seedlings here young plants and then over here these are green calabrese broccoli and I'm not doing crop rotation very much because with no dig gardening it's not as important you're replenishing the nutrients in the soil every single year and as far as diseases are concerned unless I spot a disease I'm not going to worry about that too much I like to grow perennial crops because they're really reliable you plant them once and then they keep producing for many years and they look beautiful look at how gorgeous this kale is it's doing so much better since I put in this wooden stake I put in quite a few different stakes mainly flimsy bamboo and then I put in this wedge of wood and it's really helping to give it support we do get quite a lot of wind here and you can see how large it is now it's absolutely thriving speaking of perennials all of the fruit trees these are the cordon trees that grow vertically they're doing really well and you can see that they're even starting to fill out on the arches so there are two apples here and this tree doesn't have any fruit on it yet but have a look at this one it's covered in apples and then the same goes for the two pears here these are minaret trees so it's a specially trained tree that goes vertically rather than to the side which is why there's the wooden stakes there so they're really important for support and then I've got a couple of cherries here and then a couple more apples over here and they're doing really well now I was sent a spare cherry and I plonked it in here and I didn't have any supports at the time so I just put in a little stake there just a short one but I want to show you how unstable this this tree is look at how it's moving around so that's why those wooden stakes are important because if we get a really strong storm coming through then this plant this tree might snap do you remember the asparagus crowns that I planted last month well check it out we've got lots of green foliage all of them have come up I do have them staked and supported so that they don't flop over but they seem happy enough and so I'm going to enjoy the foliage for the next couple of years and then in the third I'll start harvesting homegrown asparagus that I planted no dig these are three pots of leeks that I sowed in March and I sowed them into little pots in the house We've got Musselburgh, we've got Lancelot, and we've also got Bulgarian Giant, which is a heritage variety. I did not grow leeks last year, and that was a mistake because we go through a lot of leeks all year round, but especially in the winter. And these are a really great winter crop to be able to come out to the garden, dig them up and take them inside to make all different kinds of recipes. Now the reason that I sowed these into pots in the house is that leeks early on in the year, if they get a cold snap, that can initiate bolting later on in the season. So keeping them in the house or keep it, keeping them someplace that is temperate and isn't going to get anywhere close to zero is one of the steps to success with growing leeks. There are a couple of ways to grow leeks. The first way is multi-sown leeks and that's where you sow three, four, five leek seeds into modules and you grow them together as a little clump and then when the time comes you plant out that entire plug together in the garden so that they grow up together as that little clump 
and what you get are smaller diameter leaks, which some people prefer. I prefer leaks that are a bit thicker, those big chunky leaks that you mainly harvest in autumn and winter. And to do that, to grow them, they need to grow individually. They need to have their own space to grow. And not only that, you need to plant them deep. What I've done to plant these leeks up individually is to take them out of their pots and gently tease them apart into individual little plants. And then here in this bed where I'm going to be growing the majority of the leeks, I've got a few things to help me. A length of bamboo to help me create straight rows. I've got the hose ready to go. And I also have this, which is an old chair leg that I'm going to be using as a leek dibber. And the ground is quite hard, so I'm going to be using a rubber mallet as well. And basically, I'm trying to create holes about eight inches apart in a row and about eight inches deep to put the leek seedlings into. Once the holes are ready, all I'm doing is putting the leek seedlings into each hole, choosing the best ones and then watering them in, giving them a really good dousing with a hose. You can use a watering can as well. And that's it. I'm gonna keep these watered and let them grow. You don't need to put any kind of soil or compost into the holes. They will naturally fill up over time as you keep watering. my last video we planted up the polycrop and we put in the new Oya self-watering pots oh my gosh <laughs> we've got a cat in here surprise surprise it's not Maggie though this time it's Comet what are you doing over here boy <laughs> he's just loving the heat I think everything that I've planted in here thus far has been doing really good the peppers the aubergines the sweet potatoes have put on some good growth and they're starting to climb towards the trellis that we've put up for them. Down here, the indigo is looking pretty lush. It will get really lush and bushy before long, but I've been told that I can even take a little bit of a harvest off now to use a natural dyeing and soap making. This is a tree spinach and I've got one out in the garden and I've got this one growing happily here in this bed. This is where it's self-seeded really lovely green kind of a nutty flavor to the leaves the tomatoes have been putting on really good height they're quite healthy and every time i'm in here i'm looking for the little side shoots like this and nipping them off and i just throw them in the pathway here so that they desiccate and i'll pick them up later and i'm also taking off the, any of the flower buds as well because i really want these plants to focus on growing up and growing leaves first before starting to set fruit. And you can see I'm just winding them around the string as they grow up and that keeps them trained. You don't need to put any kind of fancy attachment to string to grow tomatoes up them. And I've seen little plastic doodads and people trying to make it really complex, but you really don't need to do that. Just wind the plants around the string and they grow up just fine. These are some of the last jars of honey from last year's harvest and they had set solid so I brought them in here where it's nice and warm and so they have remelted to a liquid runny honey consistency and then we can take them inside. These are for us rather than for selling but we'll soon have honey again. I've got some waiting to be extracted downstairs and so if you are local and you're interested in honey from my bees get in touch. The Oya self-watering pots that I put in, the ones from Thirsty Earth, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And if you look closely, the soil around here, it's pretty dry. Underneath, it's a bit more moist, but especially around the Oyas, that is really nice and moist. And so, although I am watering these plants still pretty regularly, Soon, I won't have to rely on that at all because they will have their roots right up next to this water source 
and we'll be getting water directly from these pots. And as far as these large water reservoirs, I've only filled these up once, so the large ones once since the last video, so two weeks. And then I also had the idea, let's put some greens right along where the Oyas are growing. And even though it's really hot in here, they're not suffering at all because they're not losing any moisture. They are just drawing moisture straight from those pots. So this is, I think, a good idea for if you live in an arid region or someplace that gets really hot in the summer. If you put oyas in the soil and plant your lettuces and greens around them, they won't get water stressed and you'll have probably a lot better chance of growing lush greens. I have a pretty decent sized growing space and our property here is about half an acre. Not all of it is vegetable growing area, but I'm working on that. <laughs> there are wild bits and bits where the bees are and lawn areas, etc. But despite having all of this space, I still grow plants in containers. And usually when people grow plants in containers, it's because they don't have the space to be able to grow in ground. Well, I grow in containers for two reasons. First, if I have space that I would like to grow plants that isn't ideal for in-ground situations, for example, the deck where I have the veggie pods and I have some dwarf apple trees and other more ornamental plants as well. And the second is if a plant is potentially invasive, for example, horseradish or Jerusalem artichokes, and I'm going to be potting up some Jerusalem artichokes in just a bit. In here, in the polycrub, this is a really ideal situation for growing heat-loving plants, but I've filled up all of these beds back behind me. There is this little nook here, which is why I've brought out the auto pots, and these are pots that I introduced to the garden last year, and they are self-watering from this reservoir back behind me. It's gravity-fed, and it feeds water to the bottom of each one of these pots, about a half an inch, I would say, maybe a little bit less. There's a float in the back and that regulates how much water is in each pot. So it helps keep the potting mix that's in the pots moist from the bottom up, which is great. And what I would like to do is pot up these loofahs and I'm going to be using these in soap making, but they're also edible. The young uh, fruits are edible and I want to grow them up these strings here. And then I also have a cucumber that I'm going to put in here as well. Most of the cucumbers I'm going to be putting outside and some in the greenhouse, but I wanted to put one in here as well. So I'm gonna pot these up here. And what I have is some potting mix that I've just mixed together. All this is, is it's a majority of green waste compost. This time I've purchased, but could use homemade compost or composted manure, a couple of handfuls of fish bone and blood as a natural fertilizer, and a heaping amount of vermiculite. And vermiculite is one of my favorite potting mix additives because it adds structure, it's free draining, and yet it does absorb water. So it holds it away from the potting mix so it doesn't become a sopping mess, but it does retain moisture within each particle, which is like a tiny, tiny reservoir of water. So I'm going to pot these up and start training them up the strings in a very similar way to how I do the tomatoes and get them watered in. Harvesting these broad beans is really exciting. It's only the second time that I've ever grown broad beans. And I learned last year to pick the pods as early as you can once they get to a good size like this, but don't leave them on the plant for too long because they can form really hard skins underneath. And inside you have a quite fluffy pod, which will go onto the compost pile, but you also have these really tender, quite large beans that are pretty good fresh or raw, but even better in a saute or 
put into a salad or something like that. Absolutely delicious. And as you can see, they're very prolific. The garden is filling up quickly. As you can see, most of the beds are getting to the point where they're full and things are going to start cropping soon as well. So these onions, for example, this is going to make some space where I'm going to put some winter cabbage. I've just sown the seeds for those. They're on the kitchen windowsill. And also there are still a few plants in the greenhouse that need planting out as well. The squash and pumpkins, they are going down where the wildflower trial is currently growing. And the cucumbers, I'm going to be planting them on pallets again, like I used to back at the allotment. And they're going down in the potato patch, kind of to the side of where the asparagus are. Aside from all of that, I have been very busy since last year creating an online soap making course. And I've told you about it before. If you're interested in soap making and using plants to make handmade soap and skincare, this is something for you and it is now out and it's ready for enrollments and it takes you through the basics of making cold process soap at home everything from the ingredients to soap additives equipment safety and i take you step by step through four different recipes including one that has calendula flowers in it another one that you can use fresh herbs from your garden so if you're interested in joining and enrolling and learning to make handmade soap, check out the link that I've left you down in the video description and you can go over and learn a little bit more. Thank you so much for joining me for the garden in June and I will see you in a couple of weeks. Bye for now.